Good morning, everyone. It's uh, wonderful to have you here today. Uh, it's, it's something to get used to a countdown, isn't it? Like, but um, we do that because of our online viewers as well. So those that are joining with us um, online, welcome to you guys as well. And uh, it's wonderful to have everyone here. What a fantastic day it is. Nice and uh, sunny and somewhat dry -er than it has been, which is, uh, um, I'm sure that the farmers would be appreciating. Uh, let me open with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we just uh, thank you for the privilege we have to be able to come together in your name. Lord, what an amazing privilege that is. And I know, Lord, that for us we, we tend to forget or not recognise or understand maybe the, the, um, um, just how amazing that is as we are able to approach you who is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Your majesty reigns over everything and is um, incomprehensible. Lord, we just ask that you would, uh, you would be with us today, that your Holy Spirit would touch each of our hearts and minds as we um, worship you in, in different forms, whether it be through uh, music, Lord, or through the reading of your word or prayer or the sermon, Lord. We just ask that your Holy Spirit would touch our hearts and minds. Lord, we just ask these things in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. Um, we'll start with our first uh, worship item, I am who you say I am. Uh, please uh, sit back and, and, and listen and, and, um, uh, and join in worship in that way uh, as we're still unable to join together and sing um, uh, in another way. So, yeah, please... Uh, Please listen and, um, and worship our Lord in this way. Thanks, guys.
Hello everyone, either physically or virtually. Uh, wonderful you could be with us uh, today. Uh, there aren't a lot of announcements to, to say this morning, but do have uh, a bit of a read of the bulletin that would have been handed to you as you came in uh, today, or if it's been emailed to those of you at home as well. Uh, just a couple of things. So last week I announced the constant Colin Buchanan and Rachel Lee. That's on about five more sleeps, so please be in prayer for that and for opportunities to, to share about their faith uh, during those performances. Um, and also... Again, a bit of a broken record, social distancing. Please, if you could observe social distancing after the service, particularly when you're picking up children down in the, at the hall there, if you could just observe that, uh, that would be appreciated. There is opportunity to, to gather together as a family and to, to speak a bit more, and, and there's a few of us going down to the park, Bushman's Dam, after the service this morning, that is, and anyone at home that's watching is welcome to come along to that as well. So ask that if you could observe social distancing here, and uh, obviously still do it at the park, but there's more opportunity to talk down there. Uh, those are all the announcements I have. For those of us here in the building, there is a retiring offering there uh, as you go at the door there. Thank you. Thank you, Maka. Uh, please join with me now as we spend some time in corporate prayer. Please uh, bow your heads with me. Our Father in heaven, your holy name stands above all other names in your glory and your splendour. You, Lord, stand alone as our mighty God, the defender of the weak. You are a just God, a holy God. You alone are the almighty God, the creator and sustainer of all things. And we give you thanks. Lord, we recognise that we are a people who have fallen away from you. Lord, that we were once your enemies, but out of your amazing love for us, you sent your son. Your son who died so that we could have life. Oh Lord, we bring, we bring you thanks. We bring you thanks that you are a God who forgives us of our sins. Lord, we thank you for the forgiveness that we have received through the shedding of your son, Jesus' blood, on the cross. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we bring our leaders of our country. Lord, we bring our head of state, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Lord, we bring our representative, or her representative, our Governor-General, the Honourable David Hurley. Our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison. Our State Leader, Gladys Berejiklian. Our local members, both federal and state, uh, Michael McCormack and Philip Donato. And our local Mayor, Lord Ken Keith. Lord, we just ask that you would give them wisdom as they lead this country. Lord, we ask that you would give them wisdom as they make decisions and choices that will affect the people of this land. Lord, we ask that they would have your heart as they lead. Lord, we think of our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world, those that suffer and pay a, a dear price, Lord, to wear your name. Lord, we just ask that you would be with them, that you would give them the courage to continue to stand for you. Lord, where heartbreak is, where they've lost um, loved ones, they've lost everything because of their stand for you. Lord, we lift them up. We bring them before you. Lord, we bring before you the missionaries that we support. Lord, I especially think of uh, Rick and Tracy Rempel, Rhonda Coates, Lord, and the important work that they do to extend your kingdom. Lord, please use them. Draw them closer to you. Encourage them, Lord. Lord, we think of our sick and elderly, those that are unable to come, those that are worried to come, Lord, during this time with the coronavirus. 
But Lord, I especially bring before you our sister in Christ, uh, Helen Brennan, who is extremely unwell at this time. Lord, we ask that in your mercy that you would place your hand of healing upon her so that we can rejoice in her restoration. Lord, we do thank you for the many ministries that your uh, place here has. Lord, I thank you for our ministry leaders and the helpers and everyone that does everything, Lord, to ensure that uh, these ministries continue to run. Lord, we pray for our online um, team as well, Lord. and We just ask for in each person that, first of all, you would draw them closer to yourself. Lord, that their hearts and minds would be, would be searching for you and would, would be rejoicing in you and that their ministry, the different ministries that we have, Lord, would be flowing out from that relationship. Lord, I just bring the teachers and kids from each of our schools here in Parks, Lord, especially the kids, uh, Lord, who, who know you and stand up for you in the uh, playground, Lord, in their schools. Lord, I just ask that you would continue to give them courage to, to stand for you. Lord, for those teachers that, that know you and love you, Lord, that you would give them wisdom and opportunity uh, to be able to, to speak where they're able to, Lord, um, the truths of who you are. Lord, we just thank you for these things. We thank you for the Christian school, Lord, that, that we have here as well. And Lord, we just ask that, uh, that it would continue to go from strength to strength as well. Lord, we just ask that you would use us here in Parks. Lord, that we would have that privilege to be used by you for the extension of your kingdom and the furtherance of your glory and your glory alone. We ask these things in the beautiful name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, we'll do our next song now, so which is, I know whom I have believed. It's <laughs>
Some da- sometimes the uh, best laid plans can come unstuck, can't they? <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm not blaming the drummer at all. Right here. <laughs> Talking about drummers, Dan, would you mind coming up and speaking, please? Uh, if you've got your Bibles there, I'll get you to open them uh, to our passage today, which is in 2 Timothy. So, 2 Timothy 1 8 to 18. 2 Timothy 1 8 to 18. Thanks, yeah, Dan. That's all right. He's still the best drummer in our church. Um, And, uh, yeah, it it might be in keeping with uh, the fact that we are allowed to make errors. There's a couple of tricky names in here, which is why I think Matt asked me to do the Bible reading. So let's focus on 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 to 18. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Saviour, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed, and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. What you heard from me keep as the pattern of sound teaching, with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. You know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Phygelus and Hermogenes. May the Lord show mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. May the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. You know very well in how many ways he helped me in Ephesus. Thank you, Dan. Tim Hansel, in his book, You Gotta Keep Dancing, points out that most of the Psalms were born in difficulty. Most of the epistles were written in prisons. Most of the greatest thoughts of the greatest thinkers of all time had to pass through the fire. Bunyan, you might remember, wrote Pilgrim's Progress from behind bars. He was in jail. Florence Nightingale, too ill to move from her bed, reorganised the hospitals of England. Semi-paralysed and under constant menace of apoplexy, Pasteur was tireless in his attack on disease. During the greater part of his life, American historian Francis Parkman suffered so acutely that he could not work for more than five minutes at a time. His eyesight was so wretched that he could scrawl only a few gigantic words on a manuscript, yet he contrived to write 20 magnificent volumes of history. Sometimes it seems that when God is about to make preeminent use of a person. He puts them through the fire. Undaunted, not intimidated or discouraged by difficulty, danger or disappointment. Let's pray. 
Lord, I just ask that uh, you would give me the words to speak in each of us, Lord, myself included, the ears to hear. Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would touch our hearts and minds. Lord, that we would walk out of here changed. Lord, and considering that which you have, that you have spoken to us today about, I ask this in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. So again, let me welcome everyone as we work our way through to Timothy in a series that I've called Undaunted. Um, as I touch on each week, the definition of undaunted is not intimidated or discouraged by difficulty, danger or disappointment. This week we're going to be looking at the remainder of that 2 Timothy 1 passage, uh, 8 through to 18, as we've just read, with this sermon titled, Suffering for the Gospel. Before we kick off, though, into the nitty-gritty of the passage, let me encourage everybody to make sure you read through this, it is a short book, of 2 Timothy, at least a couple of times, read through it. Familiarise yourself with this amazing letter. Read it with expectation. When you come to church or do church online, come with a knowledge on what it is that we're looking at. It's an absolute ripper letter. It's an it's amazing letter from Paul. One that we would all greatly benefit from if we were to not only listen to our teaching on the passage, but even more so, if we were prayerfully reading through the passage ourselves. Pull out, uh, pull out that Bible app. I'm just trying to think the different options you have, the, or whether it be on your phone or whatever, or your Bible, for those that um, have your paper Bible. Whatever it is that you have, use it. Open it up. Use it. Read through this letter. Okay, let's check out this passage. 2 Timothy 1 8. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or me or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Well, if ever there was a positive start for a sermon, really, that would be it, wouldn't it? Not too many times you're going to hear a call for the people to join with them in their suffering. You won't hear this message preached by the world, will you? The world wants to avoid anything to do with suffering. The world promotes the welfare of the person where they think that the person you should think of only number one as being a priority. Promoting a life of suffering just doesn't sell in this or any generation. And yet this is what Paul's calling for here. Let's break it down. 2 Timothy 1.8 So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Do not be ashamed of our Lord and Saviour and what he has done for you. Do not be ashamed to wear his name. Do not be ashamed to share what he means to you or what he has done for you and others. Don't be ashamed to stand up for Jesus. Don't be ashamed to stand for that which he stands for. And don't be ashamed of others who wear the name of Jesus boldly, who testify to what he has done in their lives and testifies as to what he can do in the lives of others. Do not be ashamed. Are you ashamed? Do you wear the name of our Saviour boldly or do you try and hide it? Do you speak of what your Lord and Saviour has done for you with passion and conviction or do you avoid the topic for whatever reason you might have made up in your head? Which probably really boils down to the fact that you might be just ashamed of Jesus. He's okay, he's okay here at church, you might think, or at Bible study. But in the real world, Jesus or my Christian beliefs need to stay in their Sunday or Wednesday evening or whenever our Bible studies are, box. Jesus is bad for business. 
Jesus is a threat to my honour and to my reputation with others. Is this you? Are you ashamed of Jesus? Let me put a warning out there for you if this is you. Jesus says in Luke 9, 25 to 26, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and the holy angels. Friends, what good is it? What good is it to gain the whole world? What good is your reputation with non-believers if you are willing to forfeit your very soul for it? Jesus isn't good for business. Jesus and what he teaches isn't good for your reputation in this world? Then boo-hoo for you. Boo-hoo for you. Luke 9, 26. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and the holy angels. I don't know about you, But that scares me. That scares me more than the opinion of anyone in this world. As individuals and as a church corporately, we need to stand boldly for Jesus in every city. When it comes to evangelism, I'm challenging each of us, every one of us, every one of us. That means anyone in this room, anyone watching, online. I don't care where you are. Everyone, no exceptions. I don't care how young or old or anything. I'm challenging you to think of somebody, to be bold for Jesus, to think of somebody who has, let's try something easy, who has fallen away from the faith or the local church. I'd hazard a guess that every one of us would know someone who has fallen away over the years, either in our local context or in a wider context. And I'm calling for us, calling for you, us, to lift their name intentionally before the throne of God. I want you to pray for them daily. Pray for them daily. And then I want you to be bold and courageous And I'm calling for you to be intentional in your relationship with them. Ask them about their Christian walk. Challenge them where they are at. And invite them back to church or to some church event. I don't care what church. Really don't. I don't care what church. As long as that church stands for Jesus, take up the challenge. Don't be ashamed of Jesus or his gospel. Encourage one another in this. Pray for one another. We need it, don't we? Anyone here not need prayer? Put your hand up. Now, I can't see online, so if you put your hand up there, you're wrong. (laughs) We all need prayer. Pray for one another. Don't be someone that thinks the cost of sharing Jesus with others is okay for others, but too costly for you. Paul here calls for Timothy to join him in his suffering. Have you ever suffered for the gospel of Jesus? Have you ever really suffered? If we have suffered in the past, which I've got no doubt that we have, do we think we've done it once, maybe twice, and that we don't need to go there again? Is that you? Is that me? Let me explain why we as Christians, as followers of Jesus, should be willing to suffer for the gospel. This is not a negative thing. Friends, your own salvation has been a free gift for you, hasn't it? Free gift for me. You have done nothing to deserve it. Nothing to deserve it. God doesn't owe you anything. It has been given It has been offered through the will of God by grace and grace alone. Which is what Paul points to 
in our very next few verses, just in case you were wondering. 2 Timothy 1, 9 to 10. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purposes and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Wow. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Saviour, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and who has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. It's because of this fact, friends, that we are saved. Not by what we have done, but because of the grace that we have received from God. We are saved because of the suffering and the death of God's own Son, Jesus, so that we could have salvation. That in response, we in turn, we we should be willing to also suffer for the gospel. Friends, we've been called to share this good news with others, to be heralds for Jesus. Paul recognises the importance of this role as we see him explain it in 2 Timothy 1, 11 to 12. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. How about you, friends? If you became a Christian thinking that life was going to be a bed of roses, then you were deceived. You were deceived. Don't get me wrong, Jesus came so that you could have life and life to the full. There truly is a peace that passes understanding. You can ask most Christians and they can can confirm that for you. There truly is a deep-seated joy that we should all have in Christ. In Christ, we really do find ultimate purpose and life and true happiness and contentment, which can be found nowhere else. Nowhere else. But this doesn't mean that everything from this point forward is going to be trouble-free. It's not going to be hunky-dory. In fact, the opposite is true which is why I need you to have courage. It's why you need to have your eyes open. It's why you need to be undaunted in your stand for him. As we see in 2 Timothy 1.8, we've been invited to suffer for the Lord when Paul says, rather join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Now, you might say to me, no, Matt, this invitation is for Timothy, not for us. We don't have to suffer for the gospel. Persecution as a believer is not a foregone conclusion. But I would respond to you in the negative. Paul must have known that there would be those who thought in such a way. So he deals with it further along in 2 Timothy 3.12. Here Paul explains, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, what's it say? I can't hear. Will be persecuted. persecuted. There's going to be tough times. There will be times when the way forward is going to be through darkness. And only our faith and our trust in Jesus is going to see us through. But in these times of darkness and faith, that we're ultimately, we're going to be ultimately strengthened. It reminds me of a poem uh, called Out of the Darkness. Let me share it with you. Out of the dark, forbidding soil, the pure white lilies grow. Out of the black and murky clouds descends the stainless snow. Out of the crawling earth bound worm, a butterfly is born out of the sombre shrouded night behold a golden morn out of the pain and stress of life the peace of god pours down out of the nails the spear the cross redemption and a crown 
Do you think that as believers that only evil can come from suffering? Then I don't think that you truly understand the gospel. Our very salvation is possible is possible because of the suffering of our Lord and Saviour on the cross. How can our own faith be truly strengthened and tested if not through these trials and persecutions that we have? James 1.12 tells us, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. When I was uh, a young fellow, I grew up on a huge orange orchard out in country New South Wales, as many of you know. My dad developed and managed what was at the time, I'm not sure if it still is, but at the time, the largest, largest citrus plantation in the southern hemisphere. Um, one of the things that dad did when he planted new trees was that he would spend a good amount of time, as you could imagine, preparing the soil before the tree was even planted. Given the soil type of that land out at Hilston, a deep ripper was required to break through a fairly solid clay pan. It was huge. Um, so that the tree roots, the point was so that the tree roots could stretch, stretch deep into the soil to find water, which was uh, probably especially important out there given the annual rainfall was only 12 to 13 inches. In this type of country, you need to be sparing with your water and to give the trees the best chance to thrive. While the trees were young, what you'd do is you'd limit the irrigation that they received so that their roots would push deep to find the water that was held in the soil. A bit of stress and suffering for the tree early on would, especially in a drought, in times of drought, when water is scarce, mean that their deep roots would keep them alive and healthy, while all the other plants around them would struggle for survival. As the temperatures uh, were so high out there, those scorching hot Hilston days, honestly, it was a relief when it dropped below 40. Those trees that had suffered at first were now safe as they drank the moisture at a greater depth than their contemporaries. Friends, never look at suffering for the gospel of our Lord and Saviour as being something necessarily to avoid. When all your stops, when all your supports have been pulled, when you enter the time of pain and heartache, when you are persecuted for your stand with Jesus and the truths that he has taught, when you have that desert experience, when you are exhausted, spent and desperate, they are the times, they are the times when your deep roots will kick in as you put your faith in Jesus and you are able to rest in your deep-seated faith in one who knows in Christ. Remember this saying, when your roots are deep, you endure the heat. When your roots are deep, you'll endure the heat. Remember that. At this point, though, I want us also to throw out a warning regarding how some people can confuse suffering for Jesus with their own self-inflicted suffering. Only in the past few weeks, I've had a conversation with somebody who has grown weary of the suffering that they have endured due to their circumstances in life they blame God for their hard and painful situation. But the truth is, they are suffering not for the glory of God, but because they have followed their own voice, their own desires. They knew what God wanted them to do, but they ignored his clear will and followed their own evil desires. They blame God for the situation that they find themselves in, despite the fact that God had told them not to go there, not to do it. God knew the consequences of their actions and they knew those consequences as well. And yet the evil desire to serve themselves 
instead of God outweighed what they knew was the right thing to do. Why did you let this happen to me, God? They cry out, despite the fact that they turn their back on God and refuse to listen to him as he warned them not to do what they were doing. In their anger towards God, they told me that they would live their own life now and do the things that make them happy. How quickly they forget that all the decisions that they made up until that point was exactly that. It was exactly that. Decisions that they thought would make them happy, but instead led to pain, heartache and destruction, both to themselves and to those around them. God has given us the gift, all of us, the gift of free will. It's a privilege that we have in where he allows us to serve him and to follow his ways. And yes, there will be suffering, but there is at the very least some meaning to that suffering. And we have a God to help us through it and we know that we will find reward in the next life for it. Or when we serve our own evil desires and suffer, unfortunately, it's a suffering that is needless and it often leads to further suffering and destruction, which has only come about because of our own sin and disobedience as we are turned away from God and have instead served our own evil desires. But there's a beauty even in there, isn't there? There's a beauty even when we do that, even when we fall away, even when everything has been stripped from us. Jesus knew we'd do that. He knew that we would make these mistakes. He died for us because of them. This leads well into the reasoning that Paul gives us in 2 Timothy 1.9, where he explains that he has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything that we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Wow. That is a huge verse, isn't it? That basically encompasses the entire Bible. As believers and followers of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, it's you and I. It's you and I. We have been called to a holy life. Friends, it's a calling. It's not a suggestion. It's not just on Sundays thing. It's a calling. It's a life that we, you and I, have been called to by God. It goes hand in hand with following Jesus. And Paul again reminds us that this calling into Christ, into a life that is holy, isn't given to us because of anything that we have done. We don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. God hasn't looked down and thought to himself, well, there's a great bloke, that, that guy and that. Wow, what a fantastic guy. Look at all the good things he does. I think he deserves a Guernsey in the, the Heavens Only Club. We've done absolutely nothing. I've done absolutely nothing to deserve Jesus and to have the privilege to follow him. As Paul says here, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. We have been called to God and are saved by God because of his purposes and by grace alone. And to add another level, this grace was given us in Jesus Christ before the beginning of time. Just sit and contemplate that for a sec. Before the beginning of time. God had planned this grace for you before time even existed. You were in God's thoughts before anyone in your lineage even existed. Isn't that comforting? Isn't that amazing? 
Paul then goes on into verse 10 and 10 and say, But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Saviour, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. This plan of giving to us this undeserved grace, according to God's plan, finds its fulfilment in God's Son when he appeared to us in the flesh, when he came to earth to live that sinful life that we could not. He died the death that we deserved and he rose victoriously, destroying the, destroying the reach and finality of death. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 to 55 says, Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Amen. And in doing so, Jesus confirms that he has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel that you and I are called to suffer for. Friends, fellow followers of Jesus, let me encourage you to be undaunted in this task. We're called to suffer for the gospel with good reason. People out in the world need to know the truth. They need to see it. They need to hear it. Not a watered down version of the truth, but the whole truth. Nothing but the truth. As we see here, eternities are on the line. To do this, to live this way, God's way, you will be called to suffer for the gospel. People will ridicule you. They will call you names. They'll write you off as a fool or someone out of date. They'll try and destroy your credibility. They will tarnish your reputation all because you stand up for the gospel of Christ Jesus. There will be times when you will ask yourself, is this really worth it? You will ask yourself, is it really worth it? And I want you to know, I want you to know, without a shadow of of a doubt. Yes. 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 It is. Friends, read your Bible. Make prayer a habit, not an afterthought. Know what you believe. Stand up for who and what you believe. Everyone, whether you are a follower of Jesus or not, Jesus strongly believed that you were worth dying for. I have no question of doubt in my mind that he is worth living for. If you don't know him, if Jesus is not your Lord and Saviour, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it, you, my friend, have been deceived. Be bold. Be courageous. And someone who is undaunted, don't be intimidated or discouraged by difficulty, danger or disappointment. See the truth. Grasp the truth. Grab hold of Jesus. Fellow believers, be undaunted in your stand and suffering for the gospel. You are on the right side of the line. Friends, do not be intimidated or discouraged by difficulty, danger or disappointment. Stand your ground. Stand your ground. Others, stand with them, even in the midst of suffering. Let's pray. Lord, we, we thank you for what Jesus has done for us. He is the example in, in so many things, Lord, but in this, 
his suffering for us. Lord, he was not intimidated. He was not discouraged. Lord, difficulty, danger or disappointment, all of which he faced, did not stop him to do your will. Did not stop him suffering, Lord. Did not stop him from saving us, even us. Lord, I just ask that for each of us that we would stand. Lord, that we would be wise in what we say and do. But Lord, that we would stand for you. Lord, even in the midst of suffering, that we would not, we don't need to go looking for it, Lord, I know. But Lord, that when it comes, that we wouldn't be discouraged by it. Lord, that we would be able to stand firmly knowing, Lord, that you are there. Lord, knowing that your, that your servants stand with them. Lord, we just thank you for the privilege it is to be able to do these things. In Jesus' beautiful name, amen. Please uh, listen as we sing our, or listen to our last worship item. Let your kingdom come. Thank you. Your glorious cause, oh God, engages a high. May Jesus Christ be known. i
Thank you, guys. Let me finish with a benediction. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labour is not in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Amen. Please, uh, um, if you've got kids, don't forget them. <laughs> Pick them up uh, in a socially distancing, distancing acceptable way. And try not, you feel free to chat with people where you're sitting, uh, but try not to congregate, especially when you're outside. Thank you.